I have one announcement, uh, if we can get seated. I'm told that if you're a social worker, your certificate will be available at the end of the meeting. Uh, so see Carol Wall, who's our uh, administrative person, who's uh, down at the down in the basement, and she'll make sure you have your certificate. We should say a word of thanks to Carol. Uh, she works all year long to put this together and does a wonderful job with organizing the conference. Yes, she can't hear her. She's down there working, but we'll tell her. Our next speaker is uh, one of the world's uh, foremost investigators in the biology of mood disorders. Mark Fry is chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic. He's director of the Mayo Clinic Depression Center, which uh, is uh, one of the members along with the University of Louisville and the National Network of Depression Centers. And he's the uh, Stephen and Shelley Jackson Family Professor of Indivi Individualized Medicine. He did his uh, medical school training at uh, UCLA and then did a fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health where he focused on neurobiology of treatment-resistant depression and bipolar disorder. Uh, currently, he's a very active investigator in uh, diverse fields uh, on genomics, proteomics, and if you don't know what those words mean, I think you'll probably you'll know them after his talk. Uh, he also does work in imaging of mood disorders and addictions. Uh, he's written an amazing number of papers. For someone that's been at this a lot longer than Mark, because I'm uh, I've been a faculty member now for over 40 years. It's hard to imagine someone that could ever write 270 academic papers that are peer-reviewed, but that's the level of productivity that's, uh, that Mark has uh, achieved. Um, he is uh, a person who's been given many awards, including the Gerald Clareman Senior Investigator and Young Investigator Award from the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, and the Mogan Scow Award for Education from the International Society for Bipolar Disorder. So we're very fortunate to have Mark with us this morning, and we have a workshop for him this afternoon if you're interested in uh, advanced psychopharmacology and other biological treatments for mood disorders. So let's welcome Mark to Louisville. Thank you, Dr. Wright. And we're switching mics. Everybody can hear me okay? Good morning. Such a pleasure to be here with you in this really unique theater in Louisville. And I'm very pleased to be part of the National Network of Depression Centers. And it's, it's wonderful to see what you're doing here in Louisville. And I'm very impressed with the energy of the group uh, and the conference for today. I would like to give you um, hopefully an example of what I hope your practice will look like at some point in the future. So as you see from uh, the title of this talk is, I would like to review what biomarkers are and how they might inform our clinical practice and drug development in the field of mood disorders. I'm a big believer <clears throat> in using technology and new ways to study psychiatric illness to develop better interventions for clinicians like ourselves. And what that really also underscores is clinicians need to be part of research programs as we go forward if we're gonna take advantage of that technology and effectively translate that and have it cross the bridge into our clinical practice. And hopefully we'll give some examples of what that uh, could look like for, for all of us. <clears throat> so I want to uh, display my disclosures here. What's relevant for this discussion is, as an employee of Mayo Clinic, um, Mayo Clinic has uh, developed a number of platforms that we'll talk about in some detail as to what they are theoretically, meaning platforms that can rapidly assess if there might be a genetic variation of potential clinical concern. So by virtue of being an employee, that is a conflict of interest. I have had studies that have been funded from AssureRx, one such company. I will not be discussing that data for this presentation today. 
I will be showing some genetic variation data that was done in, uh, completely in the confines of the Mayo Medical Laboratories. A child psychiatrist was instrumental in recruiting me back uh, from sunny Southern California to Minnesota where I live. Um, uh, many people uh, still question that move for me, but I've been back uh, in Minnesota and at Mayo Clinic for the last 10 years, very much related to uh, the vision of the late David Morasic. And I wanted to recognize his work and his mentorship. Um, he really was um, looking forward in a way that many of us uh, cannot do to that same level. And uh, we will highlight some of his work and what that means as to how we might be thinking about individualizing practice or treatment strategies for the patients that we work with. So for our talk today, I wanted to um, really focus on four different areas. I think it would be important for all of us to uh, uh, be speaking the same language. So the first bullet is really talking about what a biomarker is and how that might influence the field of precision medicine. I'd like to then talk about biomarkers and how they might be used in the future in our clinical practices. And that can be used for diagnostic clarification that uh, we'll talk a little bit about. But I think the return investment for precision medicine probably will see dividends sooner, not from a diagnostic standpoint, but biomarkers that are associated with doing very well with a particular treatment or doing very poorly with a particular treatment and thus using biomarkers to guide treatment selection. So we'll talk about that in the context of treatment strategies for major depressive disorder. And we'll talk about that for um, and give some examples in the context of treatment for bipolar disorder. So what is a biomarker? What is a biological marker that we in our field of neuroscience and mental health can think about and discuss with a, a currency that we all understand? A general working definition of a biomarker, as you see with this first bullet, perhaps you see it better there, is a quantification of a biological process. That could be what a blood sugar is, that could be what a blood pressure is, that could be a oxygen utilization of a particular brain region. Um, Oops, I'm so sorry. The point of that first bullet is that it, we are quantifying something, and we think that biological process is relevant in the context of the area of interest that we have. When we quantify biological processes, we want to make sure that that measurement is valid, reproducible, acceptable to a patient and very easy to interpret. And I think this is uh, an example we should spend some time with. Many of the platforms that are now available to rapidly assess genetic variation simply require a sample of saliva. So if that sample of saliva is valid, reproducible, I think you would agree that's pretty acceptable to a patient as opposed to looking at a PET scan result where a patient might have to go into a scanner, have an arterial line put in one of their arteries, a catheter in one of their veins, and be cooped up in a very claustrophobic tunnel for 30 minutes as we capture data. That imaging modality may be valid, reproducible, but it might be a little less acceptable to patients that are particularly prone to claustrophobia. I'm just saying. We want the biomarker to have statistical power to really identify sensitivity and specificity. And then you can see 
a number of development stages of how we think about biomarkers. Let's look at uh, a discovery biomarker. We want then to validate that biomarker. We want to see if that looks different in cases and controls, um, how that might be used in clinical trial or clinical practice. So this is a, a, a position paper um, published by the International Society for Bipolar Disorder um, with um, a colleague of mine, Benicio Fry. Everyone keeps thinking I've made a spelling error, but it is uh, another Fry that has done this good work. And I show this to really emphasize that biomarkers or biological measurements can be many different things. You can see that we have neuroimaging, biological or biomarkers as it relates to brain regions that might activate uh, with a particular neurocognitive task, a set of neural networks that we think might be related to a diagnosis or a symptom burden. We can see biomarkers that are in the periphery, looking at inflammatory biomarkers, neurotrophic factors, uh, measures of oxidative stress, and we can see biomarkers that can also be genetic, and you see a number of uh, genetic variations here that have been investigated in the context of diagnostic contributions to mood disorders. So I, I want to underscore that the talk that will be given today is not resembling your clinical practice circa November 2018. These are research projects that are now looking at how we implement, Im, implement them or study their utility in clinical practice. So this is what our clinical practice might look like in the future. And this slide reminds me, um, as Dr. Uh, Gianruco Ferrugia is the new um, CEO of Mayo Clinic, that our innovations or our research is a journey. We want clinicians and scientists to be thinking out of the box and to be thinking big, um, but all of our research really has to start small, um, and we try to move as quickly as we can. Um, I think we're pretty good at thinking big and starting small. I wish we'd move a little more quickly for uh, the sake of our field, our practice, and our patients. So let me give you some examples of how we're thinking about biomarkers and how that might influence our practice at some point in the future. We've been very fortunate to develop and create the Mayo Clinic Bipolar Disorder Biobank. This is something that uh, I've had the honor and pleasure to work with a statistical geneticist from the inception of this project and that partnership was critical to have a clinician who knew the illness, knew where there was unmet need, knew how we could quantify clinical variables and work in partnership with a statistical geneticist to better understand genetic disease risk. So this resource was created in 2009 and it, is, it has two goals, is to really look at biomarkers associated with disease risk, and our interest initially was uh, primarily in DNA, but uh, that interest is expanding to uh, proteins and metabolites. But can we use a biological resource to identify biomarkers of disease risk? The second part of our uh, goal of the biobank was to look at developing a biological resource that might help us identify treatment response patterns. And we thought from the very beginning that we'd see this as a pair of bookends. Are there biomarkers that would be associated with really doing particularly well with a treatment in a way that that biomarker would come into practice and that medicine would get to the right patient at the earliest time point possible? The other part of the bookend was to recognize that, that we may be able to identify a biomarker that was associated with having a bad reaction to a treatment. And the example that was very clear to us from the very beginning 
was antidepressant-induced mania in bipolar depression. If we could identify a biomarker that was associated with having a bad outcome, could that change our clinical practice in the future where we would stay away from those treatments and look at alternative interventions? So this has been a, um, a, a very highly collaborative partnership with the Lindner Center of Hope and Sue McElroy, colleagues in the state of Minnesota, uh, David Bond and Scott Crow. And we've had a number of postdocs come to Mayo that have returned to their home institutions and are now helping us collect a much more diverse and inclusive uh, sample with colleagues in Santiago, Chile and in Monterrey, Mexico. So as an example of a biomarker for diagnostic classification, we thought about the challenges uh, we have in this country with diagnosing children and adolescents with mood disorders. And we thought that this might be an area of potential investigation. What is on the left should be very clear. We see uh, advertise or cover stories like this quite frequently, whether it's bipolar disorder or mood dysregulation disorder, but young people with serious symptoms of mood dysregulation and energy change. What I'm showing you on the right corner, which may be less familiar, is what one very observant psychiatrist can do um, from the standpoint of clinical research. This is a bar graph uh, that was highlighting Emil Kraepelin's work where he identified patients with bipolar disorder who needed to be hospitalized, and his hospital was next to his home, um, and he simply depicting graphically the age of onset of bipolar illness requiring hospitalization from a good number of years ago. But what I find remarkable is to really look at that age distribution and confirm in contemporary times that this is an illness of young age onset for many patients. If we could try to develop a diagnostic tool that would aid a clinician to clarifying the type of mood disorder that was there or not, that would change our practice. That would change the way we practice uh, diagnosing and treating young people. That to me has profound treatment implications. For many of the clinicians in the audience, you'll know that one of the predictors of doing well with lithium, one of our gold standard treatments for bipolar disorder is intervening early. When we are treating the first, second, or third episode of mania with lithium, we have a higher rate of treatment response in comparison to treating the eighth, ninth, or 10th episode. So I, appreciate the dilemmas of not giving diagnoses to young people, but if there are symptoms that are associated with a disability that need a diagnosis for treatment, that's important. If we watch episodes unfold, not sure what it is, not sure if we should treat it, and it's bipolar disorder, it's safe to say that we're actually reducing the likelihood of treatment responsivity for that patient because we've not intervened as early as we can. So biomarkers for me are really about helping clinicians, giving them tools to provide greater diagnostic precision to their work. So here's a couple examples of what we've been thinking about. So we know from Kraepelin's work that this is an illness um, that can often start early in life. We know from a, a number of genetic studies that there is a genetic predisposition to bipolar disorder unequivocally. It's probably not a gene, and we don't know exactly how that genetic risk unfolds, but we know that it's there. So one of the ideas that Dr. Crow Arkin, our um, child psychiatry chair at Mayo Clinic had was why don't we actually look at the literature and look at candidate gene findings in bipolar illness and let's just count those genes 
see if they are more common in young people with the illness as opposed to people who've had the illness at a later age of onset. So what I'm showing you in this slide, going from left to right, the left column are three genes that by rigorous genome-wide association studies have been identified as having disease risk SNPs, which you see in the second column. So a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP is a piece of genetic variation that in this case is different in cases, bipolar disorder, versus controls, healthy controls. Um, these three genes and this handful of SNPs were the best data. I seem to be going in and out of this microphone. Am I hearing, it? am I hallucinating? Um, um, so we'll hope that gets better over time. What I'm showing you here are established genetic disease risk genes that have been identified in adult populations. And our goal with our biobank was to see if that genetic risk is more robust in patients in the Mayo Clinic Bipolar Biobank who had illness onset in adolescence versus illness onset in late life. So we had an opportunity to look at three biobanks in this case. The first one was taking advantage and building partnerships with a very important study published a number of years ago called TEAM, which was treating uh, pediatric and adolescent mania with risperidone, valproate, or lithium. And in that study, very importantly, a sample of blood was taken prior to randomization to drug therapy. And we were able to identify 69 of those cases that could be put in this analysis. This was a partnership with Dr. Barbara Geller and now Joan Luby and, and the entire team study. The second bullet you see is the Mayo Clinic Bipolar Biobank. At an earlier time point, we only had 732 cases in, in the bank. We now have more than 2,500. But we identified through careful structure diagnostic interview and review of the electronic health record, those patients who had early onset illness, which you see here, the 261, first episode of depression or, or mania um, prior to age 19, and then the late onset cases that you see here. We have a second biobank at Mayo Clinic that has 65,000 people in it. I am one of them with a couple cups of co or coffee mugs and blankets for study participation. This is anyone who lives in the community or is coming to Mayo Clinic and wants to participate in research. What's important about this biobank is we can very clearly um, ask to receive a comparison group of controls that don't have bipolar disorder, don't have schizophrenia, don't have a first degree relative, uh, and that's how we generated our comparison or control group. So the summary is really the bottom part of the slide, and for time I'm gonna focus on that. Remember I showed you a handful of genetic variation SNP risk genes. We simply counted those, and we counted those, how many you had, which we call a simple count, or we counted those as an odds ratio, really weighted to the strength of the study. And what we found is that our bipolar patients who had early onset illness had much higher rates of these genes than patients who had late onset illness. So we think that there is a genetic contribution to early onset illness. What that actually is, is not entirely clear. I would tell you that this, this study, which has been published, does not now mean that we look at counting these genes in cases. It means we study it more to try to replicate this finding and understand the functional significance of some of these genetic variations. But this is an example of how I think we can use genomic medicine in the future to identify the right diagnosis at the earliest time point possible. I will finish with this example and, and highlight that we have some newer data from our biobank that is looking at late onset illness. This is early with a genetic uh, impression that we see. 
really looks like our late onset bipolar cases have much higher rates of exposure to cytomegalovirus and toxoplasmosis. So now this is getting really interesting. Maybe we have an early onset presentation that might have more genetic risk, but if you remember that Kraepelin slide, we clearly see illness start in third, fourth, and fifth decade of life. Perhaps that's a different pathogenesis, maybe related to uh, an immune activation and exposure to infection. At the end of the day, the symptoms are the same, but we may see that people get there very differently. So that is an example of how a biomarker genetic could possibly be part of our future clinical practice. Again, not ready for prime time today, something to be thinking about. I wanna shift from the gene and actually go to a protein, or what we would call proteomics. So we had an opportunity a number of years ago to really partner with a company that had focused its efforts on over 10 years, 15 years, developing technology where they could rapidly identify levels of protein in our blood. And the second bullet here is really the proteomic multiplex profiling that was developed by rules-based medicine that is now uh, part of Myriad Genetics. The third, third bullet here is an interesting story. This platform, 320 proteins you can rapidly assess simultaneously, this really was built over uh, a decade plus of time in partnership with pharmaceutical companies that were developing new drug therapies primarily in immune-mediated uh, 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 cancer treatments or uh, uh, degenerative arthritic types of illnesses. So we took advantage of other areas of medicine that were really looking at proteomic expression in the context of clinical drug trials because these same inflammatory mechanisms or immune-mediated mechanisms have become of recent interest, very important in thinking about the pathogenesis of mood disorders. So it's a good example of taking it advantage of technology that was already there. What we did is we simply looked at 150 patients presenting themselves to our depression center um, and then took a sample of their blood to look at these 320 pro uh, proteins. Last bullet is for the statistical wizards in the room. We were extremely conservative in how we were in interpreting this data, uh, addressing potential confounds. As you see here, the one notable exception that we did not control for was medication status. But as an example, what I wanna show you are these results that we published a couple years ago. So what I'm showing you are six proteins that, dis, that were significantly different in groups and a a priori, something we planned from the very beginning to really look at mood disorders versus controls, to look at bipolar versus unipolar, and to look at bipolar one versus bipolar two depression. What you can see is that these six proteins are significantly different and the greatest pairwise contrast is between bipolar ones in red and healthy controls in green. Now, a, a, a good amount of our work um, when I was a fellow at NIMH did focus on transthyretin, the TTR, and retinal binding protein four, because those were important mechanisms as to how molecules of thyroid hormone would leave the periphery and go into the central nervous system. But to be frank, I hadn't spent a lot of time uh, thinking about growth differentiation factor, hepcin, uh, hemopexin, and a matrix uh, metalloproteinase. These are all inflammatory or immune-mediated biomarkers. But you can see that they are distinctly different by groups. So we would call this a discovery sample. Right now, uh, a large study has just finished uh, um, 
enrolling the last uh, participant, looking at whether or not these data can be replicated in a validation study. If that is the case, we'll start making progress about how we might see a proteomic platform or a blood draw of proteins that would distinguish, in this case, bipolar patients from healthy controls. How many of you would think that that would have really high value, a protein that could distinguish a, a bipolar one depressed patient from a control? Not me. That's not very exciting. I feel clinically I'm pretty good at doing that, but if a biomarker could distinguish a bipolar depressed patient from a unipolar depressed patient, now you're talking. That's actually a tool that could really help a clinician map out what might be appropriate treatment strategies going forward or what might be inappropriate treatment strategies going forward. So let's move from biomarkers that could help with diagnostic classification, whether it's a set of genes in early onset bipolar disorder or a set of proteins that might distinguish different types of depression. And let's look at how biomarkers might inform our clinical practice. So this is really about uh, biomarkers associated with pharmacotherapy. And believe it or not, this example that we're going to talk about now is really already in your clinical practice. If it's not, um, it needs to be. So I was struck by um, a number of these World Health Organization projections. By 2020, depression will rank second um, to cardiovascular disease in DALY, which, dis which is a disability-adjusted life year, that in this globe there are 120 million people who suffer from depression and over 800,000 suicides on an annual basis. A very important uh, breakthrough from a Pharma, uh, from a neuropsychopharmacology era was the development of an SSRI. I remember that distinctly because I was a third year medical student when that occurred. Um, we use antidepressants quite commonly. Here's the problem. When I see a depressed patient and I, I will consider an, a pharmacotherapeutic intervention, in this case an antidepressant, I've got 20 at my disposal. I'm going to write a prescription or, or uh, get an antidepressant started with very little information about the patient in my office. I am not writing a prescription really based on their biology. We have some separation where we might start bupropion versus an SSRI. But what I think is important about precision medicine is really recognizing that genetic variation may contribute to a risk-benefit ratio, and that by virtue of looking at that data, we now are starting to look at biological information about the patient in my office where I'm writing a prescription for them, as opposed to saying this drug is FDA approved, it's available on the market, it's been studied in thousands of patients. I know it hasn't been studied in you, but we're still going to give it a try. So our postdoc, Ahmed Ahmed, uh, highlighted some important work here that I find fascinating. We simply looked at drug package insert warning label revisions that were required by the FDA. And what I'm showing you here is the number of uh, drugs that have had an FDA warning label revision based on genetic variation. And you can see that psychiatry is finishing first place. This genetic variation is primarily about how medicines that are metabolized through cytochrome P450-2D6 uh, can be significantly impacted by genetic variation. A number of these warning labels are about life-threatening rash with medicines like carbamazepine, but the majority of them are concerns about a electrocardiographic uh, abnormality called QT prolongation and how that might be significantly at greater risk when people 
can't metabolize medicines through one particular pathway, um, the cytochrome P452D6. So another resident of ours at Mayo Clinic, uh, Malik Nassan, really highlighted um, the challenges of bringing these biomarkers, this genetic information, into clinical practice. So how many of you will oftentimes have a sense of fatigue or burden with the number of electronic reminders you might get in your electronic health environment taking care of patients? So if, we, if you think we have it bad in psychiatry, imagine the primary care provider who's getting reminders to do a prostate exam in that 50-year-old man who's uh, getting reminders to do PHQ-9 screening or doing an audit uh, or referral for mammogram. I am mindful that we have an enormous amount of electronic information that comes to us and we have to find ways to get through the 10,000 reminders and find the five that are really important. One thing we struggle with, and we're not alone, is when we have genetic information that's relevant. So for example, someone who might be a poor metabolizer at cytochrome P452D6, a very important metabolic pathway for psychotropics, antidepressants in particular, paroxetine, fluoxetine, nortriptyline very much in particular. Think about a young person with OCD. That young person, if we look at our evidence base, is gonna need high rates of fluoxetine or SSRIs to optimally address those OCD symptoms. Now imagine that that young person can't metabolize anything through cytochrome P452D6, and you know that Paxil and Prozac are predominantly metabolizing that pathway. We've set up a scenario where someone might be on 80 milligrams of Prozac, can't metabolize it, setting up the potential concern for toxicity or other adverse events. And that really is one of the reasons that we have a black box warning label with Prozac and genetic variation at 2D6, again, from the standpoint of QTC prolongation. So Mayo is trying to develop this electronic health record interface. It, this is a, an example here of when we try to prescribe the medication, if we know that someone's a poor metabolizer at 2D6 and it's buried somewhere in the electronic health record, if I write a prescription for Prozac, I'm gonna get a flag and says, dear Dr. Fry, are you aware that the patient you're prescribing Prozac to is a poor metabolizer in the metabolic pathway. The warning's not so friendly. And I have to acknowledge that, yes, I'm aware of that, but my clinical intuition is more than, um, than you. Uh, or I can get more information and I get logged on or get linked up with askmayoexpert.com where we talk about what the potential significance of that is. We have to remember that we are generating millions of data points for our patients now, and we've got to find a way with the electronic health interface to get the most meaningful data at the point of care to, to really maximize outcome. So I got a little more policy-ish with that commentary, and. Uh, but, I, but I think it's an exciting way to think about how we're moving forward. Um, let me shift to a couple examples in bipolar disorder. I know we need to, to end in about 10 minutes or so. The theme with this part of the, of the talk is recognizing that drug development is a very expensive undertaking uh, in this country, and a number of drug development programs have failed, meaning that whatever that drug was, they failed to show separation between placebo and that drug, therefore not getting an FDA indication, therefore stopping that development program. And I would argue that that's the right thing to do. But there may be circumstances with a particular drug mechanistically or a subset of mood disorder patients where we might want to revisit um, what those 
failed studies were and really ask could a biomarker give us greater precision in identifying who might do well. So for example, what I'm showing you, am I showing you? I've got these beautiful slides, but I don't see them here. Has it always been off? I hear assistance. Did I do something? I don't know. I thought you were going. Oh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I'm going to be quick. Uh, here's an example of, of, of what I mean by a, a potential biomarker to revisit uh, an area of interest. So for the clinicians in the audience that work with bipolar patients, you know that lamotrigine is a mood stabilizer that has an FDA indication in the maintenance phase of the disorder. What I'm showing you here is the clinical trial development of lamotrigine in the acute phase of bipolar depression. This study that I, uh, on top, which is separated from the vertical line, is a study that Joe Calabrese did 18 years ago that showed that lamotrigine was, in fact, effective in treating the acute phase of bipolar depression. The drug development program for the next one, two, three, four studies failed to detect a difference between lamotrigine and placebo. And that is why we do not have an indication for lamotrigine in acute bipolar depression. I am grateful that we have it in the maintenance phase because this is really one of the most helpful mood stabilizing treatments for many patients. I'm showing this last study of a LAMLIT trial, which was adding lamotrigine to lithium uh, done in Europe by Vanderloos and colleagues. And in total, what I want you to see is that despite those four negative studies, when we do a meta-analysis bringing studies together with similar design to increase statistical power, we see a signal that diamond is actually away from that vertical line showing a statistically significant difference between lamotrigine and placebo in these trials. So imagine if we could actually find a biomarker that might help us identify who would do well with lamotrigine. A study we were very interested in looking at was really based on the mechanism of action of the drug and an imaging technology that we thought was unique to, uh, to this question. This is my simple diagram of showing you what a molecule of lamotrigine does by blocking a voltage-gated sodium channel. And by doing so, we block the extracellular release of excitatory amino acids glutamate and excitatory amino acid aspartate. If you block the release of aspartate, as you see here, we start to build up the intraneuronal amount of aspartate. And if we have acetyl-CoA around, we actually produce something called N-acetyl aspartate, which is a neuronal marker we can measure by MR spectroscopy, and it is thought to be a measurement of neuronal health. And here is an example of a NAA mark that you see here. Um, and what I'm showing you in this slide is a group of bipolar depressed patients in blue at baseline where their NAA measurement, a biological quantification, was significantly lower than controls that you see in red. What I have on my arrow now is the blue bar that has significantly increased after 12 weeks of lamotrigine therapy. A NAA deficit seems to be normalized with lamotrigine. Could we imagine a day in the future where we're debating whether or not to work with this medication and before starting the prescription, we get a quick MR spectroscopy scan to see if that bipolar depressed patient has an NAA deficit, and if so, we consider this medication. Now, to be fair, this treatment um, showed a brain effect. We showed an increase in NAA. We did not show a mood effect. The mood effect did not correlate 
to this brain effect. And that may be study design, too small of a sample size, or perhaps there's a different uh, biological principle that we need to be thinking about from the standpoint of treating depression. Um, this work was uh, published by Paul Kroarkin a couple years ago, and we're looking at replicating that data now. I think for time, I'm gonna move on. I know we'll have a workshop this afternoon, and I promise you we will address some of this. Let me take one more example, um, and it really is focusing on the depressive phase of bipolar disorder. This is a, an example of a young woman um, that I uh, work with uh, who receives treatment at Mayo. Um, for many of you who have not lived in Minnesota, our winters are long and they are dark, um, and that can contribute to significant seasonal affective uh, depression, which can sometimes be challenging to treat. What I find complicating as a clinician is recognizing that as that winter proceeds into February, um, depressive symptoms can often become more robust and invariably clinicians may work with antidepressants in bipolar disorder. And then we hit something called the spring equinox. When we have this significant light change, we know that that biological disruption can cause mania but I've just started an antidepressant on this patient four weeks ago. And how do we ascertain what might be a candidate disease risk gene of, of, the, of prescribing the antidepressant versus a circadian rhythm abnormality related to the, to the illness? So one approach we've had is to look very carefully and confirm by clinical expertise and electronic health record review someone with bipolar disorder who was started on an antidepressant and within a very short period of time became manic. If any of you have had patients uh, with this sort of adverse event with the pill bottle referencing the name of the, of the antidepressant and then your name as the prescriber, this makes an impact and you think about ways that we can prevent this from happening again. So, Joanna Bernaca, our statistical geneticist, was interested in really looking at f previous research. And what I'm showing you is the five studies that we looked at that were evaluating the relationship between the serotonin transporter, in this case the short form or the S allele, and antidepressant-induced mania with an antidepressant in patients with bipolar disorder. And in these five studies, we did not see a statistically significant association of risk. What we did find, and it really underscores how important all of the clinicians are in this audience as we think about genomic medicine, is that the definition of antidepressant-induced mania was all over the map. I think you will agree there's a temporal finding of starting an antidepressant and three weeks later being in a hospital with a manic episode. That, that temporal finding, we said, yes, that makes sense with antidepressant-induced mania, but being on fluoxetine for a year, getting manic, getting hospitalized, that causality for us was, of, of, was less convincing. So in our Mayo study, which I'm showing you here, um, we had a very narrow definition of antidepressant-induced mania, and we did not find a relationship between the S allele and antidepressant-induced mania. When we put all these studies together, we get this wonderful p-value of 0.059 that says maybe something's there, not sure what. We're looking at it more carefully. My last slide before conclusion is to really show you that in an exploratory analysis where we looked at that S allele and a couple other areas of genetic variation within the transporter, we had a very interesting finding that with the L allele and a second genetic variation uh, and a third, when we analyze them together, we call it a haplotype, but this haplotype might actually protect against developing antidepressant-induced mania. 
So again, this might be an example of if we're struggling with a bipolar depressed patient not doing well with various psychotherapies or mood stabilizers, could we draw a sample of blood and feel more assured that an antidepressant induced mania was not likely? That's something we are looking at um, with further research now. Let me close with um, an, um, a final uh, slide here. The work group, we're going to go back to these slides and talk about them in greater detail. But I'm hoping that you've heard today that the future of our practices may look very different based on work that we now do with biomarkers that can quantify biological processes that may help us uh, give greater diagnostic precision that's relevant in the context of mood disorders when we think about differences of major depressive disorder and bipolar illness. Treatments, treatment foundations are different in that regard. We have examples of how biomarkers should be informing our clinical practice right now, and that is, in essence, drug warning label revisions with antidepressants given um, metabolism concerns and, and EKG abnormalities. But I think the real, the real task ahead of us is to continue with these biological biomarker research initiatives, but we've got to find the right way, and we're not there now, as to how this important biological information can be rapidly integrated into an electronic health record at a point of care, a clinician and a patient in an examination room making a decision to pursue a treatment, having information at the ready right there. Let me thank you for your attention and we'll talk more later. <clears throat>